department at 615. My name is Mark Bedanza. I am the chairman of the Finance Committee. With me is um, the clerk, uh, Pauline Cormier, uh, and the third member, David Cormier. So, Mayor, I'll let you begin. Okay. So, as I said prior to the meeting starting and sharing with the councilors that are here, um, the budget document is really a story, a reflection on um, how the city spends its money. It's a story about um, a whole lot of things, but my budget presentation every year, I sort of like to include some things like capital improvements. So I give you a snapshot of exactly um, what's happening in the city, where we're spending our resources, and I, I blend them all in, and we blend them all in, so that you have really a, a, a snapshot and a reflection of, of last year's budget in comparison to this year. Um, I will start off by saying that in most instances, um, various departments in the city might ask for more money than they might get. You know, the request might be larger than what we're able to pr provide. Uh, but that is always the case, and that's, um, that's okay. That, that happens. And the other piece of this is that the state, and just as a kind of disclaimer, the state has not passed their budget yet. So while we may have, as I spoke last night, um, we may have a letter from the state saying, this is how much you're going to get to repave streets in your Chapter 90 funds. And we got that letter months ago, and what I anticipated rates uh, might be. But until the state passes the budget, you can't spend that money. So a Chapter 90 paving program will be on hold until we get that money appropriated. The second piece is, obviously, the, the whole debate about the Chapter uh, 70 or foundation budget that's been going on for some time now. It's been an issue. I think Lemonster brought that issue to light many years ago when it wasn't such, uh, wasn't what it hadn't yet affected every community in the state, and so didn't have we didn't have a whole lot of audience at the time, but it was very clear that eventually the foundation budget was going to um, impact everyone, and it has finally made its way there. So the state has not passed their budget. So when it comes to, to numbers like in the school department, we don't know what those final numbers are. There are three versions. There's the uh, governor's version, there is the, the state senate version, and there's the house version. At the end of the day, what happens for the last 25 years, 26 years that I've been here, there's a meeting of the minds, there are committee level media, uh, uh, meetings, and ultimately we will finally get a passed budget before the end of the uh, fiscal year. And that's not until then is when we actually know what will happen. So let's try to condense a whole lot of information and make it as user friendly and transparent as we possibly can. But it is hard to believe we're talking about the fiscal year 2020 budget. That is a picture of the park at, at the corner of Laurel and Mechanic. Uh, fiscal responsibility and sustainability for the future has always been the case. Um, you really have to look to the future. Uh, in many cases, it's like sort of predicting what might happen in the commodity market or what might happen in the stock market, looking at simple things like it wasn't long ago recyclables were worth so much money that people had made a business out of going out and collecting recyclables, metal or cardboard or whatever. Uh, that market, and we've seen in 26 years, that changes. Uh, keeping what we own and fixing it first and putting it on a regular maintenance schedule so that we're replacing uh, technology and equipment um, you know, I always go back to the story that when I left the police department, we had uh, six uh, barely functioning police cars and one van that uh, Joe Gentile used to use to paint the crosswalks. And if we needed the van, we would unload the, the painting equipment from that, and that gave us the seventh vehicle. When I, just about the time I left, we were using that paddy wagon because we had no more, we didn't have cruises. I mean, the city had, was in the midst of financial uh, times, and we learned difficult times, and we've learned from that, and we tried to be prepared for the, the recessions, and uh, you know, remember in the last recession, which was worst since the Depression, um, we had no layoffs, and we managed our way through. We didn't cut any programs. We didn't close the library. We didn't cut our street lights. We continued to deliver all of the services uh, that we had done in the past. So that's, for us, it's about fiscal responsibility and sustainability, and the word sustainability is sometimes overused, but it's basically preparing for the future. No other than a homeowner would do with their own, you know, budget at home. We've come a long way, obviously. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. 
we went from no stabilization account, and again, I always preface everything by saying it were different times. The people that were here, it no fault of theirs, they were faced with uh, Devon's closing, with the recession, a number of different things uh, coming on the heels, uh, on the back end of a, a huge building boom in the city. So I cast no blame, but here's a snapshot. We didn't have a stabilization account. Uh, we could, we're in a tough spot to borrow money. Uh, every department needed equipment. We had, you know, the bond rating wasn't good. The pension liability was, it wasn't funded. And you can see from the past to where we are now, uh, we've learned and it's taken some time, but uh, long-term planning and sustainability has is, is worked in our favor. There's some of the other comparisons um, for infrastructure, overcrowding of the schools, negative free cash to positive free cash every year. I think everyone remembers overcrowding, leaking roofs, leaking uh, boiler systems, oil burner systems. Uh, one of the first thing I did when I got here, there was, there was a, uh, apparently an a, a oil leak that made it, manifested its way through from pre-street school all the way down to the rear of the old Foster Grant uh, Lagoon. And that was costly for us to, to take care of, but since then we've removed uh, all of the um, oil tanks in the city. I don't think, do we have any left? Lincoln School's coming out, there's one between this building and the Gallagher building, and, and again, that will uh, set to remove those. So a whole lot of improvements to the schools. There are tens of million dollars worth of assets in the city, both in the schools and the city. And when you let them go, you just look at a building like Samoset that cost us $14 million to build in 1995. The cost of that project today, if for somebody that hasn't been maintaining a building and now is forced to do it, you're looking at anywhere from 76 to $86 million to build that same school. It's nothing to hear. Every high school to be built in the state right now is, is well over 100, some two and two and a half million in the case of welfare. We budget every year 2.2 million in debt service for school projects. Although some of the projects may be paid off, the bigger ones, uh, all of those projects you see above there, are, you know, think about your roof at your house is anywhere from seven to twenty thousand dollars. You can imagine what it costs to build uh, a new roof on a building, and we do take advantage of um, reimbursements uh, on this school building assistance program, which helps immensely, immensely. Uh, the AA two rating reflects the city's history of favorable financial operations. Everything at this point is in place. And the only thing that stops us is probably socioeconomic. More than likely, um, you know, the diversity of the city is a, is a good thing. Uh, probably the only thing that affects us in, a, in any kind of an, an, another way is when you add up uh, a Southboro and a Northboro and look at their socioeconomic uh, diversity and in terms of what people can make as salary. So they look at that as a little bit, you know, that we're not quite where they want to be. If you remember the last time Moody's upgraded us, we were doing better. But in all categories, the l only place where we wouldn't end up at the top rating would be in that capacity. But I do think if you look around and you look at the data, we are improving. Um, Moody's isn't generally too liberal on, on, on giving that highest rating because of that. Other than Northboro and Southboro, which are sort of neck and neck for the highest in all of Worcester County, and that's a big area, we still are, are third highest in the, in the county for having the highest bond rating. Simply, if you've been the uh, best thing I can explain that to, if you've been to purchase an automobile anytime soon, and you go in to find out how much you know it would be if you financed it, well, the answer would be it was based on your credit rating. Well, so is just about everything else today. And not so much your credit rating, but um, you know, how good you are at paying your bills, but how good are you at planning for the future? And are there any um, warning red flags in there? Are there things that you're doing in there that Moody's might say, this is just gonna lead you into trouble? And so um, for us, it's, it's something that we uh, place a lot of faith in when explaining this to businesses that move to town uh, or taxpayers. Every year we show you what could make the uh, bond rating go down, the decline in available reserves, erosion of the tax base, significant increase in debt burden. What about strengths? Strong, strong financial position with ample reserves, plans to address long-term liabilities, including pensions and OPEB. Excess levy capacity provides improved financial flexibility. 
And for six years in a, in a row, we did not raise taxes here in the city. And keep in mind, whether you raise taxes or not uh, in the city, the foundation budget, the formula, <coughs> makes an assumption that you did. So if you don't raise taxes, then you better have another, you better have compensated for that tax increase. So it's, it's a double whim. So you're not getting, you're not getting the tax revenue and you still have to make that financial com contribution to, to the, um, so when people talk about, you know, taxes go up every year or we're, we follow Prop 2.5, and, a half, um, and again, in that formula, it's assumed that you've gone up 2.5%. <laughs> and if you don't, then you have double to make up for. So we went six years. So we have excess levy capacity event that we needed it for some reason. We don't. This budget doesn't reflect that. We'll move on now with what happens with free cash and in a number of communities and not to point to them to say the better off, uh, the worse off that they are, the better off we are. But just as an il illustration, there are communities that already are behind next year on uh, free cash and uh, uh, have a, a, a reliance on free cash for one-time purchases or their general budget. So they would get ready with their budget and take X amount of dollars anticipated in free cash and say, let's put that towards the budget. I've met with a number of those communities. I've seen it. All it does is it's a million this year, and then you're going to make up another million, and then it's two million next year, and then three million the following year, and eventually you're in trouble. But um, we've had a lot of success with our free cash. Um, the only time the city of Lemister borrows is for those big projects, for, the, for things like the schools, uh, water and sewer treatment plants, a library we borrow for. Everything else, we use our free cash uh, to purchase. So everything else is paid off in, in cash. Whether it's the phone system or uh, mobile data terminals in both police and fire departments now, traffic cars, fire equipment, DPW sweeper, a new truck they just received. And, and one of the things I have to say is whether it's technology or equipment like you see automobiles, everyone doesn't, uh, nobody you know, the one thing that we have is a good system in place where we're taking care of things and trying to extend the life of everything that we have. So if the life expectancy of a, a laptop or, or, or a, a, a mobile data terminal might be three years, we're getting five and six years out of it because we're maintaining it. So we're not just saying, well, we're going to just run this for the life of, its, you know, of, the, of the warranty. We're going we're to maintain this properly and make the, any repairs that we need to do so that we can extend the life of that particular purchase as long as we can. Again, uh, the Chromebooks for the schools, the new fire deputy car, uh, cash match for the Mechanic Street Park, and all of the projects that we've done, anything you can think of that required a, mark, uh, a match of some kind, then um, we used free cash. Not only are we saving um, from having to pay the bond, and remember, when you borrow for these things, and many communities will go out to bond for these kinds of projects. What it does, though, is it takes up space. So think of bandwidth in your, you know, you get X amount of bandwidth on your phone or your laptop or whatever it might be that you're using for technology. Once that bandwidth is filled up, then you can't access any more data unless you pay for that. For us, um, debt service or, or our ability to borrow is predicated on a ratio, so it's, it's like anything else. How much can you afford to borrow? So if you're borrowing for everything, you get to the point where you might get to a project you can't borrow for because you know, they're gonna look at us and say that's high risk. So that's a really good reason for using cash for one-time borrowing. And again, they're one-time purchases. Um, we, we make those purchases and we're done. It's, that's the extent of it. Uh, so there are some of the projects that we've done. Um, and again, they're all paid for. We, in this budget, you'll see every year, as we've discussed with the Finance Committee for the um, for City Council, every year we're trying to become re less reliant for things like snow and ice. So most com uh, many communities will even deficit spend, and then that comes off your free cash and your cherry sheet the following year. So it's nice to do in deficit spend so that you're not having to pay those bills in the middle of winter, but boy, when you need those projects to get done, and you can't access that money because you've already used it the previous fiscal year, it's, that's a tough one. And so we haven't done that. We can go to the next slide. Our 2020 budget meeting our obligations and more. 
efficient use of our resources come from good planning. We saw, and we all experienced being in the city, massive development in the city. It was uncontrolled, people were upset, schools were overcrowded, you could feel it anywhere you went. We just had too much development going on, couldn't even begin to keep control of it. We're left with unaccepted streets, streets that are in poor condition, and uh, it wasn't a positive experience for the city, but we weren't the only ones. I think a lot of Eastern Massachusetts, Central Massachusetts experienced the same. We're not experiencing that now. Uh, many of the other communities in our area are because they weren't experiencing. So the further west you go, the least prepared sometimes they are to deal with these issues that we had. And so there's lots of land to develop. There's 50, 60 square miles of land to be developed, and it's a lot of you know, gravel and, and uh, uh, good material, so they're having an explosion of development and it's not controlled and they're experiencing what we did in the 80s and early 90s. There are still challenges. Obviously the state has more and more that um, they're trying to do, whether it's the opiate issue or trying to help out with education and, and, and uh, expanding the MBTA and MassDOT's reach and getting the, you know, the train system into the south coast and doing the red line expansions to Somerville, et cetera. So these are all things that the, the, the state has taken on and they've tried to be good like we do. We, we, we try to do as much as we possibly can within our budget, but sometimes you just can't do everything you want and state is still down over the past decade by 11%. Uh, the distance between required local contribution for education and state aid to the city is still significant. There are your numbers. And again, we're still waiting for this year's budget uh, for the state to pass their budget. Um, it'll happen. It's, you know, the taste today's, we're getting to the second full week of, of the month, and um, they've always passed it. I expect they will. So things may uh, move around, especially for the school department. Again, there's another illustration or a slide showing their required spending, state required spending up minimal state aid increase. Again, they have so much that they've taken on that it trickles down back to the communities in terms of how much they can actually help us. Chapter 70, district profiles, limits the contribution up more than twice the state average. Required local contribution summary, the statewide average increase is 21%. Lemis this increase is 42.2%. And there are the communities around us as a comparison. I'm sure you've been following school budget news in the area. Um, many have cut out many, many programs, languages, tutors. So it's been tough on everyone. Hopefully this, this foundation budget review, the recommendations by the committee are going to be taken. Uh, I know, Claire, I, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm, I, I know. Maybe you can update us later. But, you know, where Lemis was in the lead in, uh, in terms of saying this is not, this foundation budget doesn't work and maybe it hasn't affected you, but we've got to get together. and. We could find few followers or people that wanted to, you know, jump on board, and now, you know, now I think it's impacted everybody. But anyway, there's just a, a slide to sort of give you a snapshot of what's going on in the area. So here we go. There's our general fund appropriation, 129.9. I call it 130. Is the water fund appropriation, sewer fund appropriation. Um, tomorrow you'll get a chance to talk to the water department. We are, on a, we are on a receipts account. Many communities are on an enterprise account, which means we can only spend, John, we can only spend what we collect. Our budget can only be what we collected for the previous year. So that's, so if you have a year where the, similar to the drought, that was significant to us because our receipts were down for that year. That had to be reflected in our budget for the following year. The budget rep represents a 4.4% 4 .4, uh, increase overall. There's our water department increase of 50, I call it, I round the numbers 52 million, I mean, I'm sorry, 52,000. And then um, the sewer department increase is $185,000. Uh, and you know, and you'll hear from Roger tomorrow, we, we try to keep the rates low, but we try to use grants and try to make our um, investments in the, um, when we can and make them significant, and so we do a lot of the work ourselves. There's our net school spending from 07 to 19. Average overnight school spending has been 920,000, 
94862. None of the improvements that we make to the schools or the additions or new buildings or transportation count towards that. This is where you might have to revert back to your books on our functional summary, but we basically highlight the major parts of local government, uh, general government, public safety, education, public works, human resource, uh, surfaces or resources, uh, culture and recreation, uh, debt service, miscellaneous, and uh, uh, retirement and other post-employment benefits. Is our operating budget, and again, that's taking into consideration everything spent on education, so any loans that we've had to take, transportation, but it gives everybody sort of an idea of, of uh, the comparison because it's the one area you can look at other school systems and say, what percentage of your budget do you spend on education? Everything. So th it's 64, 30 something, 36. Can I just ask, just to clarify that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that 84 million or 85 million, which is 64%, that includes state aid, right? That includes all the Chapter 70 money. It includes oh, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. So it's not just city. It's not just city funds. I, I just want people to understand that the 85 million isn't coming out of local property taxes. That's a big chunk of that is coming from the state. And the same thing with every community in the state, every city and town. So absolutely. That's why I say if you want to compare school systems in the yeah. percentage of what they spend in their total budget, that's a good way to look at it because that's the. I mean, that's that's everything. That's water, sewer, schools. That's transportation. That's everything, debt service that we spend on it. You can't find that number anywhere else. It's very confusing for the taxpayer when they ask you a question because there's so many variables and you start explaining. This is, this is pro the simplest way, that I hope it's the simplest way for you to sort of pass this information on. But do, doesn't that really inflate the school department? Doesn't that really inflate the number? I mean, because if you're looking at water, sewer, all of the other departments, they don't have a big influx of um, state aid coming in. I mean, the school department has the vast majority of state aid coming in. So that number is really twice what it should be. No, actually it's a reverse. Because the only people paying for water and sewer are the people that get water and sewer. So they're the actual, so if you get assistance from the state or wherever it might be, not everybody goes to school. Not everybody uses the buses. Not everybody uses the buildings and not everybody, you know. So you have to look at it and say, well, look, water and sewer is standalone based mm -hmm. on the receipts account. That's 100%. You know, we don't use employees from the water department for anywhere else in the city. When we borrow, that's, that's paid for not by the taxpayers but by the water and sewer rate payers. When mm -hmm. you borrow for a school, that's paid for by everybody, whether you have water or sewer. If you're a taxpayer and you have a building and property, you pay. So it's actually in th the reverse. But that's a good way, of, the easiest way that you can get, because all the other ways are just confusing for people, and they can take and put all these graphs up and everything, but it really doesn't matter, because you can look at anywhere and say, what's the total amount you spend on, on education? And again, if it's $4 million or $5 million we spend on transportation, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but in the end, you, you, I can't stop the school bus to stop to get on to take transportation to get to my job up at, at Target. So this is, this is a way of, of sort of explaining that. Nor do, in, in the same instance, money that comes in from ambulance service, we don't take and say, well, that didn't pay for the ambulance service. It does. It comes into the general revenue account, and then it's appropriated. So it's sort of the same thing. Um, expenditure highlights uh, will utilize Prop 2.5 levy increase. Our fiscal year 2020 tax levy is 77, almost 77. Uh, million three hundred thousand. The new growth local estimated receipts will increase by 1.2 million. That's important. That new growth is critical. And I think three years ago when I was here, I said, you know, we're not going to get, you know, a lot of the areas built out. You've got to look at small business in those areas of town that haven't been developed, and those are really critical for us. I mean, you get X amount of dollars from re additions and people put wood stoves in, and that counts towards new growth when people do that, and anything that gets added to the tax. Um, when it gets added to the tax assessment, but really the new growth is going to come from business. Pretty self-explanatory in terms of um, the highlights of, of um, where the, the fiscal 2020 budget is going to be spent. We'll go by that. 2020 budget reflects funding for settlements reached between the city and all of its unions. Still working on one of them now. Hopefully we'll have that resolved. 
but um, basically we're, we'll be beginning the new 2020 year with our um, contracts uh, settled with all um, union and non-union employees. Health insurance premiums increased. We've had some years, John, I don't know, nine or 10 percent, but um, we had been using six or seven percent. Um, this year we were on the side of seven percent and the appropriations totaling three hundred sixty-five um, thousand dollars will be the increased in that and that's a um, that is some uh, that's our contribution but employees as well are, are picking up some of that too so that everything is prorated so that will change as well so um, the OPEB co uh, contribution for active employees uh, increased by 127 128 uh, thousand and then the pension contribution for 2020 for the retirement system has achieved full funding status for 2020 it has decreased from 8 million in 19 uh, to 2 million uh, roughly 2 million in 2020 and I think what I've explained both to the school department and here is we don't know what our new costs are going to be so what we have to do is put the uh, current cost so there's still even though it's paid to 100 percent you still have your active cost is the, is the normal cost $2 million? Yes. Well, we'll know once we get yeah. the final, but in that area. So those other accounts will be transferred out. The, 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 the difference between the two amounts of $8 million and two will be transferred out, but will be transferred out and used similar to free cash because we don't know. You know, the market is so volatile right now. If next year we went and spent all that for fixed cost, and we came back here next year and we were in trouble, we would have already hired people and then we would be looking at laying people off and we'd still have the issue of having to keep the program, uh, keeping it funded correctly at 100%. So um, for now, what we'll do is transfer it out and it will be used similar to, to, so to free it's, cash. So it's reserved right now in the, as, yeah. a, as an when the decision appropriated is. as reserved. Right. I yeah. know I've discussed some of this with school department folks. Um, a big piece of that is school department related. I think not, about not a big piece, one point eight million. Right. Okay. Which I think is big anyway. But, but it, it, so what would happen is that would be transferred out. So it wouldn't the, be one point eight. No. No, it'd be lower than that. Yeah. But yeah. anything over a dollar is a lot to me. Yeah. So if so how it would work is the school department would put a list of things together, which I'm sure would come very easily. They have plenty of things to, to do, um, whether it's a, a, a more of a long-term strategy for replacing computer equipment or technology. It, that's one of the things that you know, gets lost sometimes. You never seem to have the money. So whatever it is, they would submit a whole list of those things, and we would just transfer those funds. Same thing on the city side. Um, there are so many things to you know, to use it on, and we, we could accelerate, um, you know, some of the projects that we've been working on. So that's how that would work. It doesn't go away. It doesn't, it's not wiped out. It's not sitting there never to be used, to be carried over. It's going to be used, but we need to know what the actual amount is for normal cost. Okay. Um, there's never a whole lot of positions. I think um, I had discussed in the past with you the overall goals for the city at the time and we have were grant funded uh, for those positions at the police department for domestic violence coordinator and substance abuse outreach i've got to tell you uh, beyond my expectations what these two employees uh, could have done it's uh, way exceeded my expectations the grants all have run out uh, there is no other funding that we know of and we'll continue to look but we're going to be bringing them on full-time, paid, they were full-time, they're going to continue to be full-time, but now they'll be paid for. I think when you hear from the chief tonight, he will share the same uh, sentiment that this was a, a high priority for, for, him, uh, for, the, for himself, the police department, and myself, that we keep these positions funded. The budget uh, funds three positions at the DPW, two positions in highway, one position in forestry. Um, you'll hear from the DPW um, tomorrow that we are now um, have to follow OSHA, and we have storm regulations uh, act to follow, and there are a number of, it's, it's a lot of, both of those areas of compliance. And um, most communities, if you check um, other budgets this year, they're hiring full-time employees, and uh, in many cases, we're providing stipends for now, because otherwise, we'd be peeling off other people from other jobs to fill these positions. 
we found new, one new. We had gone from a half-time to a full-time employee in the mayor's office, so that's in the budget this, this year. And that's it. Uh, was that the highlight for the city? Yeah. Okay. And um, this is, again, based on what we know um, today. And Claire, you, Council Free, you might be able to enlighten us a, a, a little bit more. Um, I don't know if you want to do that now or not as to what, I, I mean, I'm hopeful that it's going to be more money for the, you know, they're going to have to settle on something. And we went on the governor's budget, John. So they're going to have to settle on something. It's going to be more money. It's just we don't know how much more money it's going to be. All in all, um, the total amount, and remember, the, the areas that, so the school committee can transfer money from expenses to uh, salary and wages or vice versa. It can't transfer money from transportation or debt service over to normal expenses, whether it be salary and wages or um, expenses. But they do have the ability to sort of move in those different columns. So there's where... Um, there's where the, the assistance comes from, uh, from the state. There's the House and Senate, uh, charter school aid, and the net education aid. So all in all, the variance between last year and this year, from 19 to 20, not counting the pension money. That, again, will be transferred later. That's set as if it's a uh, normal cost for uh, pension will be an increase of um, a little over three million, almost, yeah, over three million. And that does include an increase in uh, cost 350 in, in transportation or, or debt service. I think long term, I think most would agree that uh, from everyone on the outside world who knows this issue, um, is pleased. I think they're wait, we're waking up communities that haven't addressed this. It's becoming more and more. I mean, eventually, it's going to become more and more of an issue. But um, we become the lead, you know we are the leader. It's a, we're at 100% funding. We now have the ability to self-fund an increase for a colon increase to employees. And when we hire people, we can look them in the eyes and say, when you retire, no matter when that is, there'll be money there for you. And more and more. Every budget I've looked at this year, and it's been dozens, the amount that they're appropriating to fund the unfunded portion of the pension program is getting higher and higher. So that's money that's getting taken. So not only are they 100% funded, and not only are they not meeting their normal cost, they're a actually taking money away from the regular budget to cover the unfunded part. And that amount is increasing in every community, no matter what size it is, every year. And that's coming from every department. It's f interesting sometimes to play the pick my house up and move it somewhere else. We could do that for you tonight. Uh, but we looked at the uh, fiscal year 19 average single family tax rate um, and the average single family tax bill statewide, which is close to 6000 and we're teetering on 5,000. And again, there are all kinds of, you know, that you can break down a thousand different ways, but it's the sim simplest way we could give it to you. Again, you can pick your house up and move it to other communities in the area and look at what a 1,500 square foot, you know, ranch house built in the last two or three years is in Leominster, and you can move that to something comparable in Sterling or Westminster or wherever you might go. Wendy is worth 10 times her, her salary. She just keeps bringing in the money. And whether it's, uh, and, and the reason is, I think we do good projects. And when we submit them to both the state and the federal government, they're projects they can actually support. And we have a long standing relationship with them that when we say we're going to do a project, it's going to be done right and for all the right reasons. And it's going to come in on time and it's going to come in on budget. They're never going to have to wish that they didn't ever involve themselves with us in a project. So we continue to fund the small business coordinator and maintain economic development coordinator to help maintain and grow our tax base. And, um, you know, we're on top of the economic development part of it and just beginning to see some of those companies in the metropolitan Boston area say it's just becoming too expensive for us and we think we can provide bonuses to our employees to move a little west 
of that central core that seems to be, you know, seems to have gotten everybody from the West to move to the East because they're following that sort of skill set and talent into the inner city because you know, obviously that's where they want to live. So in order to get those employees to work for you, you've got to move, you know, you've got to move closer to where they are, that specific cluster of, of, um, of skills. And just recently now we're beginning to see that sort of move here where you could give people tax incentives, lower tax rates, pretty much anything you wanted to give them incentives to move here, and they just wouldn't. It's not because we're a bad community, we don't have things they want. It's just they have to follow where their employees are and where that talent is that they're trying to uh, compete for. And so we're beginning to see that movement now and people starting to say it's getting too expensive, there's too much traffic in the Boston metropolitan area, it's too expensive to take the train in, it's too expensive to park, and we're beginning to see that movement in this area. Uh, C-Click Fix has, has helped us a lot. Um, we can better manage uh, <coughs> problems that people have. So you take a picture, you send it in, and we can better control that as we move that problem uh, within the city, within city government to make sure the right people get it, take care of the problem, and then communicate back that it's been, that it's been addressed. <coughs> Um, one of the first communities to take a, uh, advantage of the uh, Complete Streets program. Um, I know we were one of the first to take, uh, to take advantage of open space and recreation because we had our open space and recreation plan done. And 90% of the other communities didn't. That's changed. But we have $400,000 more coming in Complete Streets for downtown in the Francis Drake area. Uh, $25,000 for the MVP program to help us prepare for climate change. And I can take anybody around, whether you believe in climate change or global warming, that's your own particular issue, but when it comes to climate change and what's been happening, I can take anybody for a tour of the city and show you what's, what's happening and, and what effects it's had on us and our budgets. So um, that's the first phase of, of that piece. The Lieutenant Governor was here to announce the grants that people are getting and to sort of um, help educate people in the area as to, you know, help is on the way. Um, in case you didn't notice, there is no boiler here in the building. It's gone. It was removed. There's also no air conditioning in the building, but this was the best time of the year to do it. And it's it's because I'm here. It's warmer. But anyway, there's $250,000 for the boiler replacement. Uh, here at City Hall, that thing was the size of a locomotive. Now it's going to be the size of a piano, basically a little bit bigger, but um, much more efficient. And $500,000 bridge replacement on Litchfield Street. Um, near the Fournier Field. No one ever seems to realize they're going over this huge culvert or bridge, but you are, um, and that needs to be replaced. And that is not covered under the federal program. That's why they came up with this program. And then 1.6 million invested in the Mechanic Street Park, 1.1 million from the state, and the rest was from us. And I have to remind any historian here, or anybody that had uh, life history on French Hill, the last time there was a, any kind of a playground or recreation area is the old Whitney Field. That is about 50 to 52 years ago that Whitney Field was in existence. That's the last time and the last place there's been any kind of, you know, a, a, a place to kick a ball around or throw a frisbee. And so anyway, those are some of the infrastructure grants that we've gotten. So that keeps Wendy plenty busy. And then there's the accountability part of reporting in on how are you doing? Have you spent the money on time? What have you spent the money on? I'm, go I'm good with pictures. So here are some of the areas um, that we've done work. And um, the Francis Drake um, project hopefully will start this year. And that will give us sidewalks. That's a, probably one of our busiest areas in terms of students that walk to school. So that will give us sidewalks from um, on Viscoloid from um, mechanic all the way to Knights of Columbus and then over into the school area. So that hopefully that will encourage more and more students to uh, walk to school and other people in the area to, to walk. There's our city and school grant partnerships. I want everyone to understand we work very closely with the, the schools and not the chair of the school committee so that, that part of my d duties are, are not there, but we continue to work closely with the schools on grant partnerships, we did $75,000 in the Department of Justice. Um, we could have applied for anything, but we applied for door replacement at Northwest and Fall Brook. 
emergency buttons for all offices and cameras for the outside administrative offices. I've said this a thousand times. It's sad that it's come to this, but each of our schools, there are hundreds. In the case of a high school, there's 2,000 students in there every day and we're responsible for their safety. And, uh, and I think we do a pretty good job of it. I think we're one of the leaders in terms of making sure that our buildings are, are safe and that we're adding infrastructure and, and technology where, um, where needed. We did $20,000 camera grant to put cameras at Skyview and Samoset and they're connected to the police station so the police station can intercept if necessary. And then to the $270,000 for the safe routes to school grant for sidewalks near Francis Drake and additional funds targeted towards Francis Drake uh, through Complete Streets, another program, and currently working on a joint application for cyber security. Small business and economic development. I can continue to say we've never had this many as far back as we can find in the history of the city. We've just never f have been able to find growth in terms of small business uh, the way it's been. And so there's a, a real good spirit of entrepreneurship here, and it's exciting, and uh, it's a whole new frontier for us. This hasn't happened since the days of the, of the you know, be, the days of like downtown, when you know downtown was beginning to mobilize and expand itself, and that was uh, many hundreds of years ago, um, since the last time we've seen this kind of growth. And when you get places like these uh, medical facilities, which we see uh, more coming on. Um, their building, their, what they pay in taxes, their assessment is higher because of the cost of the build out, whereas a normal, you know, metal building might be $100 a square foot for the actual building, uh, we're into the hundreds of dollars a square foot, not mentioning the equipment that they use inside. Process cooling is a building close to 50,000 square feet, there's a lot of development in that. Uh, project down there, the registry of motor vehicles, and a lot of other interest in almost every area of town at this particular point. So it's been good, and I think the next wave you'll see in the next two years will be ripped down in new construction. So people will grab two or three um, locations or buildings or properties, put them all together, assemble them all, and then build a, a commercial project. New police station is coming along. I think we have a really good, solid we want to get this project moving. We're not wasting any time. Let's be efficient with our time and everyone else's. So the properties with your assistance have been purchased, asbestos removed with your assistance. We've established a committee with your assistance. The oil tank is being removed with your assistance. Uh, demolition will be going out to bid. We haven't appropriated the funds for that, but we will. And we've, uh, um, we've hired a project manager uh, that was selected by the entire committee. And we, uh, we all got to vote. Uh, we narrowed down the selection to three companies. And the company that uh, did the, uh, Richard Marks and Associates, that did the work at the high school will be uh, the company that will help us uh, in terms of the project management. And, and so their role for us now is uh, they'll help us with everything. From here on in, they'll help us with hiring an architect. They'll help us with anything that, the, that needs to be done with the project. Um, they will assist us. They're, they're our partner direct partner. And so looking ahead, um, there are a number of things that the budget doesn't reflect. Um, we want to move, well, obviously I think we've got the final, final, final plan for the high school um, fields and so we can now, you know, hit that button that says let's get the detailed plans. So all the revisions by the school department have been made, right? We're on the final, final, final portion of this, and the police station will be probably two of the biggest things along with all of the projects that you heard about, and will be, um, it, with the cooperation of the city council, will be doubling the amount of streets that we've done in the past. I think the only way that we can catch up to some of the streets and the things that you hear from your constituents, the only way we're going to get those done, and I talked last night about, say, Smith Street. Well, we're ready to go and paving it, but then we find out it needs another five to $700,000 worth of uh, drainage work before we can pave it. So the only way we're going to accelerate that is to increase the amount that we're spending on it. That's an easy mathematical thing. The other issue for us, uh, the police departments that have been out to bid, Medford came in, and they're, exact, they're pretty close or a little bit less than what we thought. Now that could change. The one issue for us has been um, construction. 
the, the bids, it's, we're finding less and less, and this might just be a six month problem, but we're finding less and less companies to bid on construction projects, and the prices and cost have been going up. And that's, that's across the state. There just aren't enough people to, there's more work, there aren't enough people to do the work, and so companies are putting bids in, and uh, you know, if they're already got too much work, they're not bidding because they can't take on the extra work, and then if they are, they're like, well, everybody else is busy, so I'm gonna put in a bid a little bit higher. Um, you'll hear from the, the uh, fire chief, one of the, our short-term, long-term goals has been and is gonna continue to be um, providing paramedic service and getting, uh, we have a great fire department and they provide a great service and a great ambulance service at, at, in, in terms of our basic life support system. But more and more, um, it's the faster we can get to the patient and the fastest we can get to the call. And all you have to do is look at the data on how many ambulance calls that we go to the year, uh, go to a year, a month, a day, a week. It used to be, you know, had a lull, a few hours a day, the ambulance goes constantly. So um, we're looking at options for providing a more stable um, ambulance paramedic service for advanced life support. And the problem has been that we've had it um, with a private company, but with all of the changes that they're facing in the healthcare industry, they, we can't rely on them to the extent that we used to be able to do, and we need to backfill that with another plan. And the chief and the fire department have come up with a couple of different options. And one is to uh, do an experimental, um, have an experimental contract for a year, and that private company would provide us with um, paramedic service that we could count on, that we could rely on. And, uh, you know, so, th so there are, uh, positions that are, OSHA is going to have a major effect on us. The uh, title, I call it the Stormwater Management Act, but I know it's not the right sort of MS4. MS4, MS4 is, is something that you've got to look down uh, the road on. And those are probably the biggest things that are, are happening, other than the fact that, you know, affordable housing is, a, is, is an issue. And for us, the private sector is not handling that, and that's an area that we look at. You don't want too much overbuilding because then you end up with a surplus later and that affects everything, but um, you know, how do we encourage um, more affordable housing when our housing costs here are pretty close to what you see east of here until you get to, to the inner circle of, of you know, Boston itself. So those are the issues. Uh, Carter will be going online, They're working on the final building on Summer Street, so all of our uh, other than Tremaine Street, which I don't know if you want to call that industrial building, but every single building, old industrial building that was used for manufacturing is now either under construction or is complete. So there, there's no incentives that we could possibly provide to anybody because they're done. There are no more old buildings to, to renovate. So those are the things that we're looking ahead at um, in terms of the future for the next, for the next year. Okay. All set, Mayor? Yes. All right, so I'll check with members of my committee uh, first. Um, do any members of my committee have any questions for the mayor or his team? I'm all set. I, I don't have any at this point. All right, I'll turn to the council generally. Does any other council have a question for the mayor or his team? Um, I just have a quick question for John. Um, the debt service in the budget, $2.4 million roughly. Okay. Um, and I, I think I saw a figure on one of the slides that 2.2 .2 was school related. Yeah. Um, can you give me a general sense of how, what the maturity of those bonds are? 2022, I think, or 2023 on the high school renovation. Yeah. Is that most of that 2 million plus for the high school? Uh, yes. Okay. About half of it is. And then the additions was another 340 for Fallbrook and a couple of the others, and then the, um, we're still paying down on the Johnny Appleseed in Northwest mm -hmm. School Schools, yeah. and what we, our intention to do is when there's money freed up, that will go towards the sports complex. Okay, great. So that hopefully eventually we won't be actually borrowing in the market for the athletic complex. It'll be the interim job between when those are paid off and when the police station actually starts uh, the debt repayments. So we're not 
we're not spending money, so that money's, right? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it could kick into another, you know, you're not going to spend $26 million to build a police station tomorrow, right? right. We're going to sort of phase that in. So we've got it timed so that certain bonds are up when the other ones are kicking in. Right. And that we've done right along. That's all I had. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just, in a, yeah. just as an illustration of how things have changed, uh, so w when we started here, some of us, the recreation program consisted of a couple of, and, and that's, this was everywhere, a couple of picnic tables at a couple of the schools, and they would run morning programs, and they would run some other, um, you know, cultural programs, and and now our our programs are everywhere, and they're diverse in every way, and so as a for instance, we employ in the summertime almost a hundred people at the recreation department, so we went from two people at you know, five, four or five playgrounds, to, and then a couple of administrators and supervisors, to 100 people. And if you look at the fact that we started the boys club, boys and girls club at, um, at the veteran center, and if you look at the after school and before school programs, and if you look at all of the things that happened, one of the biggest issues that we had here is we actually passed a curfew for teenagers. Why? Because we are having a problem. All of those things have helped. So we don't have those issues to the magnitude that we did in comparison. But just running the pool, for instance, I think you'll hear from Judy, one piece, one part was, I don't know how many thousands of dollars when it's time to replace it. Um, the chemicals that we need to treat it. You know, the library and the, the, the cost of running the library and all the programs that they run. So the world's changed, and I think we still do a good job, and we stay within our budget. But that's just a small illustration of where we've come from. But what it's done in terms of, you know, um, issues that we have with teens and young adults, it's really made a, a statistical difference. Um, and our, our thought was keep them busy. A lot of them, they were lucky. They have, um, you know, places where they can be employed for the summer, not only here, but some of the retail places. So it's worked. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Sure. Mayor, John, and Wendy. Appreciate you coming. Just, Rick just texted me. Next up is the uh, library. Mark, just for the public, can we get the line item numbers? Okay, so Mark, we're on line item 192, is that correct? Uh, or 182? I, I don't think that's the line item number. It, the line item number would be in the, um, I don't know.
if we have a line item number, to be honest with you. We do. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah it's on yeah. the right side. Yeah. She's camera shy. I'll spare her. Do you want to come in? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> I know. She's blushing. <laughs> It's close to the end. Yeah. Yeah, 183 is near the end. All right, so the, the line items are from 182 to 190. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the library budget. Um, the library director, Sandra Murphy, is with us. Hi. And uh, we're going to... Hello. Hand it over to you, Sandra. Great. Um, so I'll just walk you through what um, I asked for this year. Um, not too much, but uh, one thing that we want, <coughs> wanted to do is free up some of our staff time, um, which was previously spent um, processing books. Uh, something that almost every library does is have their books pre-processed, so they come already with book covers and barcodes and spine labels. So staff just really have to stamp them, catalog them, and get them on the shelves. Um, so I'm asking for $5,000 to cover the cost to pre-process the children's and young adult books. Um, this will save hours of time uh, for the staff. And we're kind of uh, testing the waters to see if it'll work for the adult collection as well. It's something that um, I've always done at previous libraries, and it just saves so much staff time, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, so we're going to test that out starting in July. Um, I'm also asking for another $2,000 for the unclassified line item. Um, this is really to cover costs of the um, pre-employment testing, which uh, has to happen. And we've had more turnover uh, recently, so we've had to incur those costs. So with a little bit more money, we, could, we wouldn't go over on that line. Um, Another $1,000 for printing and binding. This is to support our uh, new outreach services. Um, I hired a part-time outreach person this year, Marissa. She's amazing. She's been going to all the events, so you'll see her, see her all summer, hopefully. Um, she just needs to print out flyers and things to bring out to events to hand out, so the $1,000 will cover that. Um, another $2,000 in the replacement equipment and furnishings line item. This is to cover worn out uh, staff desk items. Um, many people have been here at the library so long that they <laughs> are wearing out their desks and, um, and other equipment that they need. So this is just to cover uh, replacement equipment. And then the last uh, part is just the increased cost of the new cleaning company, who are actually working out really well so far. So it's $12,000 to cover the increased amount in that. And that's it. Okay. And uh, it looks like the uh, mayor gave you all of what you requested, right? Yes, he did. Yeah. yeah. I know. I'm Do um, any members of my committee have any questions? No. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm certainly you know, comfortable with the budget, you know, um, I, I do see as the, uh, what board counselor said that you got everything you requested, which is good. Yeah. Um, and also you still have somebody that works full time doing maintenance, right? Yes, of Charlie. All of, yeah. of all of the building. Yes. To keep up with it. Correct. And, and it still looks very good. Yeah. Um, you know, cause it's what, probably 12 years old, 12 years, 12 years now. Yeah, it's 12 years old. You know what's starting to wear out is the um, all the computer software systems, <laughs> so like our servers and the badging system and the system that handles the heating and cooling. So those things need to be replaced um, pretty quickly, but um, the building itself is great right. and it looks beautiful. Right. I, I think the maintenance and upkeep is important. Yeah. You know, I... Um, 
I certainly think we've, you know, made some mistakes in the past of sort of letting things go, mm -hmm. and then it just, you know, kind of snowballs into, you know, a $15,000 fix becomes, you know, hundreds of thousands. So right. mm -hmm. I do, I, I think the building is being well maintained, and, and I uh, just, just like when uh, uh, the former library director was there, Susan Shelton, mm -hmm. I never heard any complaints from anybody, the library, and it certainly sees mm -hmm. tens of thousands of patrons from the 19, public. 19,000 a month. 19,000 We're keeping a month. count now. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty good yeah. that that many people shuffle through. Absolutely. And I never hear any complaints. Yeah, things are going to break down, but we have someone dedicated in the building to fix them immediately, so we're really lucky to yeah. have that. Um, and I was impressed when I toured the library a year and a half ago just seeing how clean and orderly everything was. So the staff does their part as well and notifies me or Charlie of any um, building issues immediately so we can rectify them. I really believe in the broken window theory. If one thing is broken, uh, people will think you don't care about the building. So mm -hmm. I try to get things done as soon as possible. Right. Good. Good. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Any other member of the council have questions? Yes. I don't have a question. I, I, I don't comments. Comments. <laughs> I'll have a comment. I'll have a comment. As a, as a trustee, um, having served with Council Bedanza for a number of years as a, on the Board of Trustees, there's so much pride that people take in that building. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of hard work to get it done. It was a lot of um, community coming together, a lot of generosity, and I know that the staff over the years has been very, very uh, cognizant of that, and it really takes very great care of the building. So I appreciate that. I love the building. I'm just very much attached to it. And I think one... You know, all of the work, the part-time staff, the outreach to the community, library services have changed pretty dramatically over the last, <coughs> you know, five, ten, um, and change, I think more change is coming rapidly. So um, I think that you and your team have done a really great job in reaching out um, into the community and making people aware of the services and the programming that you guys do, which is great. It's hard to tell where libraries will go in one year, five years, certainly 15 or plus. We just can't even imagine it. It changes almost daily, and the trends are constantly circulating. So um, six months ago it was a makerspace, and now that's kind of passe. You know, um, Who knows what will come down the line, but I really believe that having um, people to do specific things like the outreach person mm -hmm. It's huge because that burden was falling on staff, uh, full-time staff, but we weren't really able to keep up with it. So now we have someone. We send her to the summer stroll. She brings all of her flyers. Um, she's a warm personality. She speaks three languages. It's kind of a no-brainer. Um, she's been a real, real help with us and getting the word out as far as all the new things that we're doing. So it's exciting. Okay. Any other counsel? Council of Eckley? Yeah, just a comment, really, and a, and a question. Sure. So you've been very frugal with your requests. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure that you have a longer wish list than that. So, <laughs> Always. Um, and what are the your short or long-term plans for the servers and the heating and cooling? Right. So um, Brittany, who is our new <laughs> technology librarian, mm -hmm. um, met with the ITTF committee. Are you familiar? Yes. Okay. Um, and told them about our server concerns because the server... The issue is that um, the badging system and the heating and cooling systems are so outdated that they require uh, a new server to be updated. So before we can even do those two things, we need an entire new server. Okay. Um, I believe uh, Bill Mitchell and the ITTF committee decided to fund our server portion of those requirements um, as well as the DPWs, I heard. Okay. Um, so I think he should be bringing that to you or... Okay. Um, but that would be covered, and once we have that, then we can move forward with the other two pieces. Okay, good. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Well, um, the library has always been a great asset to the city, and we appreciate you continuing to keep it a great asset. Thanks so city. much. Thank you. Great Saga. to see you again. Yep. I asked specifically to come because I wanted to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Well, Chief Goldman, we're only 20 minutes behind schedule. I think the library made us up some time. Significant So, um, welcome, Chief Goldman. 
Um, for the public, these are line items, uh, starting with police salaries at line item 426 through line item 444, police overtime 448 through 451, police department expenses 455 through 479, police capital outlay. Um, doesn't have any money appropriated, so I don't have to worry about that. Police station expenses, uh, line item 488 through line item 496. And with that, Chief Goldman, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> well, as of the previous three years, I don't have a presentation, so um, I, I, I um, That's efficient. have no significant issues with this um, budget. Um, there were some th other things I asked for that... Uh, in all likelihood got traded away for the two new employees that I have in the budget that were, as the mayor mentioned, are um, really at this point essential and um, really, really, really important for the city and do an amazing job. I think almost every council probably here has dealt with them at one point. They're, they're just amazing and uh, necessary function. I had to imagine something more necessary at this point. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't if you guys haven't dealt with Janessa, She's an amazing person. It might be helpful to the public to give a little bit of an overview of what they do and how, how important they are. So, uh, Leslie Borges is a domestic violence advocate. That's self-explanatory. She's probably one of the best ones um, in the Commonwealth. She, um, she was part-time. We had lost our VAWA grant, and the mayor um, gave me money to have her part-time. And um, in this budget, she's become full-time now that the grant awards have gone. But obviously, what she does is deal with domestic violence victims and help them from, you know, the beginning through the end all the way to court. Um, I can tell you that she's a tremendous asset to me and a tremendous asset to the victims of that and indeed has um, uh, given her services to employees of the city that have unfortunately been domestic violence victims. She's just, um, and she pitches in with other stuff. She and Janessa uh, work almost symbiotically sometimes. And Janessa got picked up on originally on um, an opioid grant for an opioid clinician to, to do outreach, which she continues to do. Uh, last year, her grant became a, uh, earmark from the state and it was only one year so it's expired and you know to lose her would have been you would have heard the, the sucking sound over the police department as she walked out the door it would have been devastating in my opinion and she works with and goes out and deals with anybody who's had an overdose tries to reach out to them reaches out to the family she provides services and coordinates and, and makes them aware of services She's also doing a um, drop-in center across the street at the church and because we found, because of logistical problems with the building and because of the clientele, that it was not, it wasn't proper to have them in the station. And some of them wouldn't come to the station, okay? So they brought me the idea of a drop-in center. It took us a good six months to find a place. And the church finally gave us a place. She's down in the cellar there um, one day a week. And she's kind of a, a, a one-stop shop because she, she does the opioid stuff and she does a lot of tremendous amount of work with the homes people. And she has the applications that they need for housing and the applications that they need for, for financial assistance and food assistance. So she's a one-stop shop over there. And a lot of her, her work too now is, is with the homeless. She, if you see a homeless person in, in Lemonster, they have been spoken to by Janessa, and she knows who they are, and she knows what their issues are. Um, recently, we started to try and partner, and it looks like it's going to work out with Fitchburg State University with the nursing students, and they're going to, um, they're ho we're hoping to get them into the drop-in center to do medical checkups on, on the people that come in. They've been out with her to check on people out in the street, and, I mean, she She's the, the program that, that, that she was hired for has just branched out, and she really um, is essential. She does a great job with the warming center during the winter. 
uh, coordinating volunteers. I mean, really, I, I could go on for a lot longer about what the two of them do. They're remarkable. It's a, they're a really great team. And um, the, other, the other component of that is, is my assistant, Kelly Valley, who's, who, who's their supervisor. And the three of them are a team. I don't know if you guys look at our Facebook page, but we're selling T-shirts now to, con to, to continue our transportation fund because we found um, a lot of the problems are that y you can't get them transported to where they need help because it's not usually close. So the domestic violence victims and the people that need to go into some type of treatment that can't afford the, the $75 cab ride to Worcester or, or down on the South Shore, we have a transportation fund now, and um, the T-shirts are, are gonna continue that fund, and what we hope to do with that is grow it so that it becomes, um, we're, we're, the police department self-sufficient in um, hotel vouchers. We don't want to have to rely on the mayor's office for that. We want to be self-sufficient, particularly over the holidays and the weekends when, you know, City Hall's not open. Well, before I go to other councilors, I'll also note that you got everything you were requested from the mayor. The only thing I didn't get that, that, that doesn't reflect in here is we asked for the captain's uh, salary to be reestablished, and, and the, the mayor couldn't afford that. But I also understand that, you know, that, that's a trade-off uh, for the, for the two employees I just okay. spoke about. So right. I'll continue to run the place alone. <laughs> All right. Very good. Uh, members of the Finance Committee, does anybody have a question? I just have a, a quick comment. Um, Chief, I want to tell you, and, and I want to thank you for, for bringing up um, your two new employees. I'm in the court system every day, and I can tell you that their resources, even to me, outside of this, uh, is, is, is unbelievable. I, I've any time I've needed something, I can make a call. I can get an answer right away. I can get uh, help whenever I need it. So um, kudos to you and to your department, and congratulations with keeping them because that's oh, a, a big I, service. I, I understand what, what a great thing that was and um, how fortunate were we to get two, like, 24-carat gold women to do those jobs. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Councilor David Cormier? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I just want to echo those sentiments. I mean... You know, this is what we're dealing with today, um, and it's it's very necessary. So I'm I'm happy to see that that's on board. Um, and I I really don't have a lot of a lot of questions, but um, one of the things that pops out every year uh, that I see dwindling was when I first got here nine years or so ago. We were looking at an educational differential, which was probably over a half a million dollars, which equivocates to the Quinn bill, mm -hmm. uh, which um, contractually we are obligated to fund um, as people retire, you know, so through attrition we are no longer funding that. Correct. 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 New people don't right. get it. Right. So th as, as the older people retire, then it continues to go down. Right. So I see this year we're looking at a mere 290000 which is really low compared to, well, like I said, what it was years ago when mm -hmm. I first got here. Um, do you have any rough idea how many employees that um, covers still? And, and I, I, I'm assuming they have some seniority too, so we should see that drop off within the next however many years? It, it, it probably will be a few years before it drops again, only because I don't know of anybody with with a, an advanced degree that's retired. It doesn't look like there's going to be more than one retirement this year, and that person doesn't mm -hmm. have one. I want to say off the top of my head it might be 17, 17. that have wow. degrees. I mean, the only time that that, that, that they new person that would have it would be um, a lateral transfer that already has it, but that's very infrequent. So, um, yeah, it's, I th and, and the other one would be somebody that already, say, had an associate's or a bachelor's degree and got the next level up. We're required to, to give them that. Um, so, yeah, it's going to continue to dwindle. I mean, most of the master's degrees at this point are, are rank, are supervisors. I, there's very few patrol officers that have it, and they tend to be the more veteran officers. Right. So yeah, it's gonna it's gonna do it again. I don't know if you're gonna see a sharp drop in the, maybe the next two or three years, maybe after that. Okay. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Other Thank than you. that, I think everything looks good. 
All right. Any other member of the council question or comment? Councilor Shalafo Zephyr. Yeah, I have a quick question. So in the uh, in the line items, this patrol in service educational and training stipend used to be funded at ninety thousand dollars, and there's nothing in it for this year. That was converted. That was that was rolled into their base in the, under the last collective Contract? bargaining agreement. So that was yeah. So that ninety thousand okay. it was just shifted over into salaries. Okay. All set. Okay, Councilor yeah. Feckley. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Exactly. I live here too. <laughs> um, what about staffing? We're, we're, you know, um, the mayor and the comptroller have been generous in bringing us from 58 to 62. I am not quite at 62 on paper. I am, but we have um, that includes people that are in the academy and includes a long-term IOD who's who's uh, in, you know in a retirement application is in, um, but really, really, really close. And that's why you see a permanent walking beat downtown now, Monday through Friday. It's why, why you've seen a, a second traffic unit added. A third <coughs> DEU unit is because of that manpower. And we have four officers that are just about to come off of field training in the next week and a half again. And, um, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a resignation, went to the state police, and I've got another one that got called up for a year's military service. So just when you think you're there, the, the, the goal line moves. But it, it, we're doing pretty good, and it looks like at least one out of those four is, is going to be able to con be converted into another specialty position, which is likely, depending on my talks with the union, likely to be a second permanent walking beat, um, 10 a.m. probably to, to 6 p.m., to maintain that presence. And then um, I have two graduating the academy on the 28th of June. We have two that just started the academy. We had three, one, one had a medical issue the first day, so we're, we're putting her back into a September academy when she heals up. Um, that will technically on paper bring us to 62. Um, I'm missing a, what am I missing right now? I'm missing a permanent sergeant. And the, the retirement in September is going to be a lieutenant. So there'll be probably another round of a couple of people hired in early next year. And that'll bring us to staffing level. And in the, in the, that, that 62, you know, and I may have talked about this last year, is I, I, my policy now is to put them into specialty jobs. And when I say, say specialty jobs, the only way to maintain a walking beat was to do it as a permanent bidded position. It, it, it's working out great. Um, and, and, the next people after that would likely be, um, when I get more people out of the academy, is probably going to be another a third traffic car because every councilor sitting here knows about the traffic complaints. So that would bring that unit, hopefully by the end of the year, early next year, up to three people, per permanent traffic cars. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, Mark, I just... I just have... Yeah, sure, go ahead. I just have one more question. I just want to... Um, sort of piggyback on the Wood One Counselor's comments about uh, patrols. Um, I mean, I've lived in Lemiston my whole life. I don't think I've ever seen any police traffic patrols as aggressive as this past spring. I mean, when I'm going down Litchfield Street, I set my cruise control at 30 <laughs> because I don't, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to make the papers, but uh, in Union Street as well. And they're pulling people over, and I listen. Oh yeah, I listen to the scanner, and they're giving them tickets. The court officer is complaining to me because he's doing so many traffic appeals now. Yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, the, the the issuing of tickets may be up as high as three hundred percent over what it was last right. year. Some of that is su that supplemental overtime line item. Uh, I do it with that too. But and yeah, are we? Uh, you know, I'm sure you're getting feedback from the you know, the officers that are patrolling. Are they? finding that traffic is slowing now that people are aware of the presence? Uh, what I gauge it on is the fact that I, we appear at this point to be about 15% under last year's numbers at this time for motor vehicle accidents. High traffic enforcement translates into lower car crashes, and car crashes is the number one call for service. Uh, I think it was 18, just, just, um, Property damage ones was I think was 1,800 last year, triple any other call for service, and that when I checked last week, um, at this time of last year, it's down about 15 percent, 
and that is likely due to traffic enforcement. It certainly isn't due to any lower volume right. in the city. Right. So yeah, it's so, it's it's working. So I guess from a budgetary standpoint, <coughs> how how are we sort of how are you fitting in this personnel? Because it doesn't seem like it was there in the past. So th a things, lot of the traffic enforcement is being done with the supplementary overtime, which is the, okay. the line item that the mayor created several years ago to plug holes that couldn't be filled by extra manpower. So if you gave me. 67 patrolmen, and I put all five in the traffic unit, you would probably see the same result, but we can't do that budget-wise. So we do a lot of that with that supplementary overtime in it. It also is the spare cars that we use, and the extra, um, the, the two traffic guys, believe it or not, only two traffic guys, they are really busy and highly aggressive, mm -hmm. and they're both unmarked cars, mm -hmm. so nobody sees them. So it's working, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely working. Good. Thank you. Council Shalaf was up Yeah, in the past, Chief, we've had a conversation down here about your, um, how hard it was to schedule police officers to do details, construction details. And is that an ongoing problem still? It's still an ongoing problem. I think that um, the, the level, the, 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 I didn't look at the stats, but the percentage of filled details is coming up. But one of the ways we're going to try and do help with that is I'm purchasing a new detail and overtime program, computer program. So it makes it more efficient to hire them and they get um, the, the lists maintained faster and the, and the calls are automated. So we're hoping we don't end up with guys missing the phone calls and things like that. So I hope to have that increase it. Um, I don't know, the, I mean, we'll, we'll never have 100% because there's just too many road jobs going on, but I think we're doing better. Mm -hmm. And your database will include, it's essentially a database that you would use to fill the jobs as they come in, and that would right. include not only Lumster police officers, but from surrounding Correct. cities and towns. Okay, your whole pool. Yeah, oh yeah. Availability. Okay, good. Yeah, so, uh, the, good. The, the program is a custom program, and, it, and the, and the um, person who owns that company actually lives in Lunenburg, and it's um, becoming very uh, widespread in this in the state. It's it's a great program. Interesting. Uh, Councilor Roger? Um, just one comment. Uh, uh, relating to uh, Council Cormier. Uh, he's lived here his whole life. I don't know if he remembers Blackie Eaton or not, <laughs> but uh, for those of us that do, <laughs> the traffic enforcement was pretty uh, pretty strict. Yeah. Um, my question, though, is on uh, personal equipment for the, uh, the officers. Uh, things like guns, you know, may... Uh, is there a problem there? Nope. You know, the, the equipment we, is all up to we, date. We are good. Um, we anymore. are in our fourth year in the vests, so we plan on utilizing the ballistic vest program next year okay. to, to replace all our vests. Um, our, our tasers are up to date. I think we just spent a fair amount of the $100,000 that you guys gave us on ca new cartridges and replacing some of the older tasers. The radios are almost brand new. The firearms are within three years old. So we're doing pretty good on equipment. I mean, you know, we're still... Uh, attempting to purchase more tactical vests for the fast reaction team, but we the whole entire day shift is outfitted with those in the helmets. So equipment-wise, we're doing pretty good. And your uh, cruisers are in great shape. They're brand new. They look nice. You know? <laughs> yeah, they're brand new. We're still we got, still got one more coming, which is the supervisor's car. It's taking the company we bought it from forever to put that thing together, but it's a command vehicle. We went with a command vehicle, and it's, it's going to have equipment to set up as a command vehicle for the first time. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Did I see Councilor Frieda have a question? How many a police should we have? Well, I mean, you know, you can go by the FBI statistics, which I think is 2.5 per 1,000 and all that. I mean, 62 is okay. It's allowing me to do a lot of things. 72 <laughs> would be remarkable. Wow. 82 would function. I mean, you, you know, there's, there's things you can do. There's a, there's a, a, a you know, and, and I kind of stole this from Ernie Martineau in Fitchburg, is a, is a team policing approach. I, I do it a little bit differently than him. Um, but if I had another 10 people, you'd be able to do that in, in its totality. But we are functioning with 62, and I'm appreciative of the fact that, that that's the highest ever budgeted in this department, purely budgeted, not, not with a grant. And, it, you know, 
when you, when you get a brand new guy that was not even off probation and he gets activated for, for a year in the Marine Corps that you had no idea and the poor kid was done in July, he was out and he got activated two weeks ago. And I have another one that's in the academy and the day after he graduates, he's being activated for 60 days. So, you know, when you have 62, that, that um, you know, if you have the full 62, that functions well in this city right now, the way we use them, but it doesn't absorb the losses that happens. I mean, I got another guy that just went out on a, on a, on a long-term IOD because of a cruiser accident. You can't, you know, we, we, with 62 people, you, you can't replace that. You know, if you had 64 or 65 or 70, you could. But no, I, I you know, in all, all honesty, Counselor, you know, 62 is getting it done. Do you have any trouble with overtime? Well, you, you, I think you, you people know the overtime is fairly high. It really what, has no, not. No, I meant in uh, cooperation on the overtime with the 62. And then in, 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 in what, the officers working it? Yeah, or? Sure. Um, I mean, it's Force a hiring job, is not dramatic. It's not dramatic, and I haven't. There's not been a lot of force hiring, a lot of complaints. Um, a, a tremendously young force right now, as the mayor likes to say, I am the oldest person on the department, and I'm only 57, and I think that's young, right? Um, so it's a very young department, and they like to be in uniform, and they like to go out there and work. So we're doing okay. I mean, you know, it can always anything can always be better, but. Uh, we're doing okay. I mean, I think, you know, if I had to really, really complain about anything, it would be the command staff is probably a little too small for a department our size. There's no department this size that doesn't have a captain. But I understand why. Okay, anyone else? All right, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Next up, 29 minutes behind schedule, is Chief Sidlow. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to make a request. Since I have a conflict, um, I do have a brother that serves in the fire department, and I can't discuss salaries and wages. Um, if we can talk about line items um, 5, 27 through 558 now, and then items 498 through 512 I will abstain from, and you can have that discussion with the, just you and the clerk. You mind that okay finance. with you, Chief? Thank you. Can you talk about your expenses first and then your it would be, salary and wages? Is that on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it would be, but I haven't been given a copy of the budget, so I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to borrow mine? I can. <laughs> um, Mark, do you want to do you want to use mine? I, I can. John, do you have a copy for me? Yeah, I'll give him. I'll give uh, him yeah, mine. Was, I think put it put it online for everybody. But I didn't. I, I, I didn't get mine. notified. I'm right. sorry. All right, David and I can share right here. It's, uh, it's here. It's here. Okay. All right, Chief. Uh, well, thank you for coming down, and, and uh, thank you for accommodating Councilor Cormier. So um, I guess we'll give us an overview, I guess, on the expense side of your budget. Okay, what, what is here? I don't know what I requested. I mean, I'd have to look. Well, it um, appears that uh, your request uh, for fire department expenses yep. was 599 599325 which was granted. Yeah. And your request for fire department equipment was so 15000 I, I, I can go down each line. Yeah. Um, you know, the first page, the first four, uh, I got what I requested. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. It's really only one page, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I know what need, I need About to work months. off my old my last year's budget compared yep. to what I got. So a thousand dollars more in the water uh, bills. Um, obviously our water. Uh, I don't know if it's because the water rates went up or our usage went up, but we we're in the deficit the last two years on our water bill to the city. Um, building and grounds we stayed the same. Went up a thousand dollars in the repair of uh, service radios. Uh, right now I'm in a deficit. Uh, for this year, um, 
all equipment radios, all the technological equipment just keeps getting more expensive and more expensive to repair. Uh, automotive repairs, we're the same at 80,000. Uh, computer maintenance, same at 25. Same on office refurnishings. Um, repair motorized equipment from 15 to 2,500 dollars. That's for all of our chainsaws, generators. Uh, we carry a lot more than we used to. A um, lot more need for repairs. Um, medical, we went up um, five thousand um, dollars. That's for all the medical supplies to run the ambulance, fire trucks, first aid. Plus, we do the physicals for hiring through there and the EMT stipend. Um, it was time to upgrade that because of the cost of materials going up. Two thousand dollars in the cell phone. Right now, I'm in a deficit on the cell phone account. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've put computers in all the fire apparatus and they run off of a Verizon card at $40 per month. So I, I needed the money to co uh, cover that deficit. Uh, they'll stay the same, the same. Um, cleaning supplies, the cost of cleaning supplies has gone up. Um, and what I try to do, I explained it last year, is I try to adjust the accounts for basically the cost of living. And some years I need a lot of tires and I'll be big in deficit and ties, but the next year I won't ask for an increase because I know my need that year won't be for ties. Um, so I try to build a uh, cost of living increase. Um, and batteries, uh, a lot of our tools are running on batteries. So the need for batteries and the expense, so I, I raised that for $1,000 more. And I think that covers it, right? Does any councilor have a question relative to the expense side of the fire department budget? Just an overall yeah. statement is um, the, the expenses. We, we don't run a much of a deficit. I'll run deficits and line items. But at the end of the year, it, I end up purchasing some, some needed equipment. Um, right now, I'm waiting on uh, the next week, and then I want to purchase some fire hose with the, the uh, excess I have in some other accounts. Right. Before it's closed out. Before it's closed out, correct. I, uh, I have a couple of questions. Fire away. Um, <clears throat> so I, I know you had a new roof put on over here at 19 Church, right? A few yes. years ago. Correct. Um, you're working on the back. On the um, there was some issues with the back side of the station. That's correct. That's all. That that's. No, that's on hold. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's on hold. Um, the back deck was rotting, um, deteriorating underneath. So we had to take it down. To take it down was we opened up um, that the, uh, the driveway going in, in the, in, into the basement. If we took the deck down, the walls became unstable. So we had to remove the whole thing. We have a uh, great flooding problem over there. So we came up with the idea of closing in with a uh, foundation and then putting an addition on the rear. And uh, that way we'd have an enclosed uh, addition that would allow us to walk down a set of stairs into the basement, truck room floor. And um, it would protect us from the overhang of the rain and snow coming off. So we got 80,000 and the mayor and I, uh, last year was we were gonna try to do it in either two phases or three phases. Well, the 80,000 allowed us to do phase one and we were able to use the DPW in Joe Poria. And the DPW did all the demo, and Joe Poria and the DPW did the foundation. And they did it uh, for, I think, $20,000 out of the 80. Well, when we started the project, the engineer told us it would be about $250,000 to do the whole project. So we went out to bid in April, and um, we had, didn't get any bidders. We went out again, we got one bidder. Now we did maybe a third of the work or more than that. We got one bidder at $430,000. Sure. So we met with the mayor and said, there's no way. Um, there's too many needs in the city to spend that money and we don't think something's wrong here. So uh, we put it on hold through the mayor's office to go out to bid in uh, the fall when there's not much work. And uh, we're also working on having some contractors we know. They may not bid on it, but at least they're gonna tell us that, you know, what we should expect. 
Uh, but we'd never started the project if we, if it was going to be that, uh, that high. It it, is, it doesn't make sense. Right. So, okay. um, you know, from a, an equipment standpoint, ambulances fairly new, right? We just bought one. Well, we have two. Well, uh, we bought one yeah. in 2016, and we rechassied an right. ambulance box in 2016. Um, they, it, when you order one, it takes about a year to get. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're doing it on free cash once a year and you miss, you know, a cycle, it puts you, you know, two years away, not a year away. Right. Um, those trucks are busy. Right. Um, the mileage adds up, and, um, you know, before you know it, you need one. Do I need one this year? No. Do I need one next year? Yes. So getting the money this year helps me get one for next year. Okay. Um, we didn't want to do two at the same time, but what happened was we blew a motor in one of them, and then we needed to replace one, so we replaced one and we re -chassied. But the, the, the chassis are both 2016s, so they're both going to time out around the same time. So if we don't replace one maybe next year, then the following year we're probably going to have to replace two or... Right. Dead. What what about all the engines? I mean, I I know it seems like we just bought some, but what seems like yesterday, you know, yeah. is probably five or six, seven years ago now. Yeah. Uh, well, um, the first engine three that we replaced in North Plymouth was, was in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, the engines are supposed to have a lifespan <coughs> of around 15 years, and then a reserve lifespan of around uh, 10 more, so a total of 25. The, uh, we replaced all frontline three engines starting in two, you know, that 2011 purchase. The, uh, in reserve right now, we have a 2004, and then our second one is a 1995. So we need to replace the 1995 because that will be at its 25-year mark um, next year. So you know, the recommendation is to um, you know, re to take it out of service at 25 years. Right. Again, it takes about a year to get one. Um, that engine was the North Lemister engine, which is the um, busiest for mileage and wear and tear. Downtown has more calls, but that their runs are longer. Mm -hmm. So even though, so it's a 1995 plus, it's the 95 that came from the station that puts on the most wear and tear on an right. engine. So my recommendation, you know, for capital outlay is, um, you know, if not this year, you know, obviously next year, but is we need a new engine, we need a new ambulance. Um, and then the last one is uh, a new pickup truck. And in the pickup truck is, we replaced Joe Poria's, which he, he's his own separate budget and everything, but, you know, I requested from the council, we replaced his pickup truck and the mechanic's pickup truck um, two years ago. And then this past year, we got money, and we just got in this with there was a new deputy's vehicle. Um, so for pickup trucks, our utility pickup trucks are hand-me-downs, or we have a 2004 Chevy um, that that's our main pickup truck. But what I've done, and when I've asked for the money to replace Joe's and the mechanics' uh, pickup trucks, was I was going to take those hand-me-downs and use them as brush trucks. Okay. So instead of asking the council for $100,000 for a brush truck, was buy a truck we use every day, we'll take their truck before it's too bad, mm -hmm. and we'll move it into the brush fire ranks. Right. So what I'd like to do is get a new pickup truck this year, and that way when it comes plow time, I don't have to take the 2004 that I'm using as a brush truck right. and plow another year with it, because mm -hmm. we may end up killing it, and then we'll need two trucks. Right that makes sense <laughs> you know and I think uh, you know I know the mayor you know mentioned OSHA and all those regulations yep. during his um, presentation this evening and you know certainly we we don't want anything to happen to anybody yeah. that that you know is operating the equipment or you know even the public I mean these we all yeah. know how much a fire truck weighs and going down the road if things fail we don't want anybody getting hurt so you know, as far as, can I address the OSHA? Sure. Um, as far as the OSHA, the mayor has asked me over the past year, is there a cost to OSHA? And I says, not yet. Um, a couple months ago, the fire service in the Department of Labor Standards in Massachusetts finally got together and had some big productive meetings. So it's starting to come down what's going to be required 
for firefighters to meet OSHA compliance. Um, not, not as much as the DPW who's, you know, in the ditch and all that, but uh, there is gonna be a requirement and a lot of us is gonna be um, documentation, checking equipment, you know, daily, which we do, um, but a much rigorous of checking our equipment, documentation, and then some new procedures. <coughs> um, we have to get fit tested constantly, um, it, working off our ladders and, and different things like that. Um, so one of my requests in the budget is for a, um, I need another officer, I need a daytime officer. And what that person would do was they would run the ambulance, uh, the EMS part, um, they would also do our fire training, and then the third component would be to comply with OSHA. So over the last few years, I've desperately been trying to get that, um, that daytime fire officer to be the EMS slash fire training, and now I have another component that you know I, I need to have done is the OSHA. So that was really important. Okay. All right. I think I'm. I think I'm good. Thank okay. you. Council Yeah, just to clarify, Chief, is that OSHA person you just described, is that included in this budget for FY20? What I did was I submitted, I have to look if okay. I got, I submitted the budget and then for um, ease was at the end. Um, I put in for a uh, fire lieutenant mm -hmm. to be that EMS training officer slash OSHA. Mm -hmm. And then I put in for a, um, a, uh, a lieutenant spot, and I could explain that in a few minutes, um, to work days, and then I put in for four additional firefighters. And that four additional firefighters, it does not include our daily staffing, mm -hmm. it's just the um, uh, number of firefighters or overtime. Yep. And we have, a, we have a problem where we have a hard time hiring a lot. Sure. So I, I would like four more bodies, it still would be you know, considerable amount of overtime, but it, it wouldn't be an additional cost to the city. Yeah, it's an offset. It's an offset. Yep. Um, so, so I put in for the four and then I put in for the two l lieutenant salary positions. So I, that's the, I explained the training OSHA one. The other one is um, uh, an IT. Um, and what happened was back around in March, um, they met with the mayor and we came up with a short term can we, plan. Can we talk? We you sure? Should. Okay. Just, we're kind of yep. getting sorry, into. Dave. I'm sorry. No, no. Sorry, we're just. Dave. We're getting. Yep. I know it happens. That we're kind of getting into salaries, and I. Okay. I just. I'm supposed to, make to be sure quick tonight. That I'm not participating. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm good with the. I'm good with the aspect of all the equipment and, the, you know, expense side. So I don't. If there's no other questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We can move on. It's up to you, but yeah. All right, we can we can get into we'll get into salary and okay. wages now. Yeah. All right, uh, so Chief. Just for your um, edification, I will be abstaining from this part. Very good. So noted, Councillor. Uh, just for your edification, on um, lieutenants who got seventy-seven thousand more than fiscal year nineteen, and on firefighters you got um, ninety-five thousand more. I think th I think that's just because of the contract. Okay. Yeah. The two and a half percent. So no new bodies, just the money to cover them. So those four firefighters that you requested, along with the IT person and the yep. OSHA person combination, Doesn't they're not in here? No, John's saying no. Okay. No. And so uh, the, what the IT is, it, back in March or a few months ago, I met with the mayor and uh, came up with a short-term solution, was uh, the police chief, the, we went to an IMC software which is what the police use. So we bought a module of the police software a number of years ago, the council funded it. So we run off of the same computer system. So th what makes it great is when we maintain sites of what type of building, who to call everything, yeah. we share the information yeah. back and forth. Yeah. 911 came in and you had to talk to the person as a trained emergency medical dispatcher. So by using the same software, their trained dispatches uh, create the call in the software and electronically send it over to our dispatcher, which is simultaneously going to the fire trucks in the field and to our phones. So we became one dispatch system and one fire record system, and it's working out great. The police was, when the police chief was the captain, he was their IT person. 
for us, I've been able to use um, firefighters that had some knowledge. And um, it, it became to the point where it need, there needed to be someone there daily because there's just so many working components to it. So Ricky Cormier, who's here in the audience tonight, um, has that expertise and he's been my person for the last couple of years that he, he, I would come, have him come in on overtime or out of the goodness of his heart, he would keep stuff working. And um, it just became unbearable. Um, things weren't working right, delays and calls and all of that. So what happened was I asked the mayor if I could move Ricky off the line, which would mean an increase of overtime for these three, three months and half of his duty would be for the police department, half it would be for us. Um, it's worked out fantastic. Um, I was hoping it was gonna be in the budget, and it's not. Um, my next step is to meet with the mayor and see if we can do something on overtime um, this coming year. Um, it's a critical, critical need of the fire department. Um, if the police chief was here, I would ask him to you know, say something about it, but if I don't, if I'm not able to do that, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> um, you know, this, is, this isn't the buying of the equipment or advising us. Um, the company that we use, uh, we used to use Guidi and now we use uh, Clearcom. Um, and uh, they're good for running the, you know, office equipment and stuff, but as far as the running the dispatching, knowing what takes a priority and how, I, I kind of need somebody that's knows the, the fire and police business, and Ricky has been awesome, so. Mm -hmm. um, we ran into a similar situation with the library. I mean, technology change have, technology changes in the library, technology demands have just dramatically increased yeah. over the years, and uh, finally, the new director has a staffing situation where she has an, an IT librarian, basically, so I certainly understand where you're coming from with the specialized needs, you know, that both of the public safety departments have. So um, thank it's you, like thank you for explaining it's that. A, it's like having a motorized mechanic. You know, all the fire trucks, we need a full-time mechanic. Um, the EIT has become so much that we need f a full-time person to do it. And with Ricky's relationship with the police chief and with his knowledge of both police and fire, the city of Lemonster, he's been a great fit. So it's basically, half the cost. It comes out of my budget, but you know, the police are, are utilizing it, so it's taking care of two departments. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine doing that, um, and I've talked to Ricky, and he's fine, so um, I'd like to see it continue some way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much yeah. for the creative solution. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Anybody else? Any other questions? So I just wanted to just double check with you on that, on your OSHA lieutenant and your four Firefighters. You're going to have conversations with the mayor in that? Well, the, the four firefighters, I, I don't think so. You know, that's the argument of overtime versus. Yeah. I, I don't see that. The OSHA. The, the OSHA in the, um, the EMS OSHA lieutenant. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I want to meet with them. Um, and then the uh, the other person, the IT person, yeah. I, is I'm going to meet with them so on that. So that's outside of this budget. That's going to be. It's outside else of the budget. Yeah, because I have to do something. We'll be coming to so, us. Okay. Um, whether we do some of it on overtime or, um, you know, we okay. private contract out or something. Um, but if it's not in the budget, I, you know, that I'm not getting those positions. No. Okay. So. All right. We'll, okay. we'll look forward to that. Councilor Shelfo Zephyr. Yeah, just one last one. So this basically is a... Um, it's a level funded budget with built with the contractual increases Correct. included, but that's basically it. There's no change. No, level, right. Got it. Uh, other than uh, uh, some expenses. Yep. Everybody all set? Thank you, Chief. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chief. That concludes. Thank you. I've got a question. Yes. Before the meeting's over? Yeah. You're going to conclude the meeting? This is for the Comptroller. Wake up, John. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I was looking for some information in the, uh, the finance report and the Munis report, and I only got pages, it, this is the Munis specifically, one, three, and five. She probably didn't double, it's two-sided. So she didn't do, yeah. Maybe when she copied it, she didn't okay. copy Okay, sides. could I have enough, could I have one with all the pages tomorrow? Okay, I'm not sure in March. The city clerk has it, we'll make sure she has it.
Okay, yeah. with with all the pages, great, thanks. Anything else? Thank you very much. Um, that so concludes Mr. the- Re Mr. Chairman, I just have a question. Um, do we have to, as a committee, officially give these further time? Because we haven't had a public no, hearing no, yet? No, no, there's nothing to give further time to. This is just an informational okay. meeting All before right. the committee. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'm going to I'm just about to tell the public that we will be here tomorrow evening uh, at six o'clock uh, to hear from the Department of Public Works, followed by the school department at 615, and that concludes the finance subcommittee meeting for June 11th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Mr. An adjournment by 730 tomorrow night, the later. <laughs> we'll do our best, <laughs> Councilor.